welcome to the Lumberia Tar Pits Museum. Thank you for that. This is an extraordinary. This is an extraordinary place. We have a remarkable connection to the past, but before I get into the program, I do have a bone to pick. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> About our name, actually. The La Brea Tar Pits, where there is no tar and there are no pits. It's true. The black sticky substance outside, that is not tar. That's liquid asphalt. Liquid asphalt occurs naturally. Tar is man-made. And when it oozes to the surface of the earth, it forms shallow seeps that are a few inches deep. So, not a vast pool like the word pits would suggest. And we're a science institution. Accuracy is very important here. <laughs> It makes no sense. We really should call this place Asphalt Jungle Shallow Sticky Seeps Museum. That's, yeah, nobody wants to go there. Tar Pits is a cool name, right? <laughs> She's amazing, isn't she? So, based on evidence, we've been able to deduce that the average Smilodon Fatalis might have looked like this. So she would have been about the same size as an average African modern day lion, but twice the weight weighing in at 500 pounds. That's because the bones in the chest, shoulders, and forearms were extremely powerful, indicating she was massive and strong in her upper body. In the skeletal remains of older Smilodon fatalis, we often see signs of wear and tear in the lower lumbar region. And that gives us clues that the hunting habits of the cat might have put a strain on her lower back. That's also evidence that supports a very popular theory, that the Smilodon fatalis was an ambush predator. <laughs> yeah, an ambush predator does that. She'll sneak up on her prey, or she'll patiently wait behind an obstruction. And if she were hungry, she would wait for a very long time, waiting for an unsuspecting victim to wander by. So we theorize that the cat probably grappled her prey to the ground, incapacitating it with her massive upper body strength, and then she would del deliver the death blow, slicing into her victim with those canines. Those imposing saber teeth could grow to be eight inches long. The front and back edges were covered in serrations, just like divots on a steak knife. We theorized that the cat probably sliced into her prey, and then would have pulled back and waited for her prey to die of shock and blood loss. That makes it easy to move in for a feast. So we know that these teeth were no obstacle when slicing into prey. She would have been able to open her jaw from between 95, maybe even 120 degrees. <laughs> so those teeth were also no obstacle when devouring a carcass. She had sharp carnassial teeth on the side and back of her jaw for chewing. She's hunting alone, but most paleontologists theorize that the cat probably lived and hunted in social groups, just like modern day lion tribes. All right, so that's the cat. Oh. <laughs> Use me. <laughs> Don't touch her when she comes near you, please. So now we're going to consider the environment in which this creature lived, because the asphalt is a time capsule for us. So it traps not just animal rain remains, but also shows us aspects of the natural world with preserved evidence like trees and foliage that paint a picture of an Ice Age Los Angeles that is nothing like today. There were no buildings or freeways back then. In fact, the average rainfall and temperature were different. It was a little cooler, a little wetter back then. So what about the nature? The sagebrush scrub you see outside at the entrance of the museum, we would have seen that back then. But what, what we would not have seen, what we don't see today, we would have seen groves of oak trees during the warmer periods and groves of junipers during the cooler periods. This is the scene of a Harlan's ground sloth feasting beside a watering hole with no idea there's an asphalt seed concealed in its path. The creature is now stealing its own face, getting stuck in the asphalt. So once it knows it's stuck, it's going to yank with its muscle might. It's going to be no match to the suction force of the asphalt. And it's about to let loose a series of loud cries. The smile on Fatalis is reacting towards the commotion, but she's not alone. Because these cries are basically like a dinner bell. So they're ringing in the ears of every hungry predator with an earshot. The number of carnivore bones we excavate outnumber herbivores by 9 to 1. And this ratio that suggests a scene just like this, in which the cries of one trapped creature track all the ravenous predators. The saber-toothed cat is first on the scene. So 
the cat is now stuck as well. She's going to share in the faith of her would-be prey. We freeze this scene for a moment because you can use your imaginations with what happens. With the addition of each new predator getting stuck in the asphalt, many of them will never get to eat a meal ever again. So we will fast forward through the gruesome details, and now we have glimpses of what's to come. The cat and the sloth are now slumped over, permanently fastened to the asphalt seat. The bones beneath the surface are beginning their long, long journey, a journey over tens of thousands of years. It's a journey that eventually leads them right back to us here in this room. The remains exposed to the air and the elements eventually decompose and rainwater comes along and covers the scene in a thin layer of sediment. So bones are very porous and asphalt preserves our fossils very uniquely. They do not mineralize like dino bones, so they stay light because once absorbed, this asphalt repels groundwater and prevents decay so successfully that when we dig them up, the remains of animals that are tens of thousands of years old appear as if they've only been dead for a few weeks. Here's a layer of asphalt coming up through the cracks, covering all remaining evidence of the previous entrapment. The weight of the next round of victims is forcing the bones underneath to break apart, mixing and jumbling them all together. So entrapment events were not an everyday occurrence, but eventually they did stack up one atop the other atop the other, and that's where we get our name. It creates an illusion of a deep pit. Based on the number of fossils we excavate, we might have seen one major entrapment event like this every 10 years. But one in a decade piles up and has left the La Brea Tar Pits Museum with the most extensive collection of Ice Age fossils on this entire planet. Since 1913, we've excavated over 3.5 million fossils. You're about to see our fossil catalog. That's in the back of this building. And some say Project 23 might even double that collection. Well, that's it for your program in this theater, but let your journey continue today. We have a lot to see. There's a Pleistocene garden on the edge of the parking lot. It looks like that. It has samples of Ice Age foliage. Zed's remains, that Colombian mammoth from the film, are distributed inside the museum at various places. Or it's a great day to see Project 23 with your own eyes. When you exit the building, just follow signs along the fence in that direction, and you'll find Project 23. Thank you so much for coming to this program. If you like what you saw, please help us spread the word. We write these shows for you, and you're the only form of publicity that we have. So tell your friends if you liked it. We'll keep bringing these shows for years to come. Thank you so much.